Thank you, AP, and thank you to, to all who's made, who've made this uh, Humanities Festival the, this, the wonder that it is. When I came here last year, I was, uh, I, uh, when the theme was resistance, uh, it, it showed how humanities touched on the themes that affect us all in our daily lives and the, the, the issues that we face. Uh, we kept in correspondence, and I know the immense efforts that it takes to put this together. Uh, and I am deeply honored to be both a speaker, well, to primarily to be the speaker this year and to participate in this in this event, and I'm honored also uh, with the uh, with being named the alumnus of the year. Uh, uh, and I've got to talk to my friend Greg McNamee about those very kind words. Uh, unfortunately, I met him for breakfast this uh, this morning, and uh, he gave no inkling. But again, uh, it's a it's an honor to be here and I appreciate the, the, the hard work that it took to put all of this together. Uh, so let me see if I can do the hard work now of uh, mastering these, uh, uh, these slides, which I hope not to read aloud. In fact, I structured them so that I would not be reading, but I do have to learn how to press the button. Let's see. There we are. Okay, now when, uh, when the theme secrecy was proposed, and AP uh, said, could you speak on that? And I said, well, I, frankly, I've not been an advocate of secrecy. Uh, that uh, secrecy is something that, uh, in fact, we've tried to move away from, but if we can talk about transparency, if we can talk about something where uh, we're taking our understanding of the world, taking the, the lessons that humanities have given us with regards to the importance of being in touch with each other and understanding different cultures and opening up doors to our own culture, to the world, uh, then I'm happy with that. So let's talk about transparency and how transparency brings trust. I mean, I grew up in Arizona. I mean, it feels like a long, long time ago. If you look at the map, the last time that I was a student here in, in Tucson, but I grew up in Phoenix. And growing up as a child in Phoenix, I used to watch you know, movies and used to think that perhaps, you know, I used to watch The Wizard of Oz. And I thought, you know, you have to cross the impenetrable desert to get to where we were, and it was hundreds of miles to any place else. And I thought, possibly, could we be in the land of Oz here? As if you look, you know, I actually make this kind of mental image in my mind that Phoenix is there, you know, Arizona is on the other side of this desert, and we're cut off from other cultures, other places. It's how it felt to me as a 10-year-old uh, in Arizona. But there were many, many other lessons that uh, I think I was able to learn from the Wizard of Oz that are relevant to this particular uh, topic and to what we're talking about today. Uh, if you look you know, at one of the lessons from The Wizard of Oz, and I'll play a little clip here, maybe you can guess what it might be. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. <laughs> so in a sense, what we have there is this idea of secrecy, that through secrecy, by doing all of our work behind this veil of, of secrecy, we present an image of power and illusion that gets people to think that we're actually greater than we are, that we're something different than we are, and that we know more than we know, that we can do more than we can do. But pulling back that veil reveals something completely different. Now, why do we have this sense? Why does this resonate so much uh, with regard to the importance of secrecy? Going to a, uh, you're looking at what we do with regards to pulling back that veil. 
in the uh, within the U.S. government, we've tried to advocate for transparency for for centuries. Actually, I would say from the very beginning of the formation of our nation, one you know, one of the themes was that we need to be, you know, we're a democracy. People, we need an educated constituency. The constituency needs to know what's happening within that marketplace of ideas. The quote that I have here from Secretary of State Seward, Secretary of State, I work for the Department of State, I'm going to pick a, a secretary. The, um, you know, the government continually depends upon the support of Congress and the people that support, and that support can be expected only in the condition of keeping them thoroughly and truthfully informed of the manner in which the powers derived from them are executed. Okay, that's 1864. The reason for that was that uh, we had uh, diplomatic cables during the Civil War with regard to uh, our relations with Britain that had been, uh, that had been made public. Uh, and it was embarrassing to our ambassador there uh, to have this information out in the public. And the ambassador was writing back to say, really, do we want to make this information public? Uh, and this was Seward's response that yes, we do want to have information about how we conduct government open and available because it helps build trust and in a democracy, a government can't function unless it has that trust. So open government uh, has been a theme for a long time within the United States, but we've been trying to promote open government for years. The, uh, I've been working on this for some time now. In fact, uh, if you look hard on uh, open on uh, on um, the internet, there's a video from a couple years ago where I'm talking about. My name is Andre Guterres, senior advisor within the Office of E-Diplomacy at the at the U.S. Department of State. For the past year, I've been putting together the State Department's 2016 Open Government Plan, which is our plan for implementing the principles of open government that were described in the 2009 Open Government Initiative. Essentially, with the Open Government Plan, we're showing the various ways that the State Department has used openness, has used the principles of open government, transparency, public participation, collaborative effort, uh, to move forward with foreign policy and accomplish the various foreign policy objectives of the United States. States government. Now this is our fourth so, open I mean, government. I won't play the whole thing, that's why I'm here talking live. But the, but this, I, but it is something that I feel strongly about. I mean, it, that, uh, it, and perhaps it's one reason why I went into diplomacy, why I studied the things that I studied, those four majors, uh, classical Greek, <laughs> ph uh, philosophy, French, uh, radio and television, or well, the languages, the understanding of human thought, and trying to uh, understand where we are as people. What do, how do our cultures relate with each, uh, with each other? And how can we convey that idea to other nations? How can we convey who we are as a people uh, to, other, to other peoples? Uh, I, you know, I looked at uh, radio and television and communications media as a way to, uh, to communicate that. But ultimately, diplomacy was a way that we, uh, that I felt that as a representative of my country, that I could convey a sense of who we are and open up the windows to our nation, to other cultures. So why, when you look up open government on, uh, on the internet or looking it up on YouTube, actually the, do we have this uh, sense that, it's, that there's something different about it? The first thing that will pop up, at least it did for me, when I did a search for open government on YouTube, was a was an episode from Yes Minister, if anyone remembers or has seen that uh, that television program from the 1980s. And the very first episode of Yes Minister was titled Open Government. Uh, here's a little clip. Head him off this open government nonsense. But I thought we were calling the white paper open government. Yes, well, always disposed of the difficult bit in the title. There's less harm there than in the text. <laughs> the law of inverse relevance. The less you intend to do about something, the more you have to keep talking about it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what's wrong with open government? I mean, why shouldn't the public know more about what's going on? Are you serious? <laughs> well, uh, yes, sir. I mean, it is the minister's policy, after all. My dear boy, it's a contradiction in terms. You can be open or you can have government. But... <laughs> 
But surely the citizens of a democracy have a right to know. No, they have a right to be ignorant. <laughs> Knowledge only means complicity and guilt. Ignorance has a certain dignity. But if the minister wants open government... You don't just give people what they want if it's not good for them. Do you give brandy to an alcoholic? Oh, uh, if people don't know what you're doing, they don't know what you're doing wrong. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Sir Humphrey. I am the minister's private secretary, and if that's what he wants... My then... dear fellow, you will not be serving your minister by helping him to make a fool of himself. Look at the ministers we've had. Every one of them would have been a laughing stock in three months had it not been for the most rigid and impenetrable secrecy about what they were up to. <laughs> what are you supposed to do about it? Can you keep a secret? Of course. So can I. <laughs> So, <laughs> I think this is the perception, and this was a sense of why there was a, 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 a uh, uh, why we should call this particular month secrets. It's what we think is behind what we do. That, we, that it's foolish to talk in terms of being open and transparent. So, we, we, what are we hiding? I mean, if you look, all around, if you look, and these are the kinds of, 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 of uh, advertisements, the things that crop up on the internet when we talk about government. You know, five things the government doesn't want you to know, or top secret, uh, ten tax facts, what the government doesn't want you to know. It's this, con this idea that there are so many things out there that for some reason we don't want you to know. 20 pimple, cure, pimple cures the government doesn't want you to know, but I've got them here if anybody's interested. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, or uh, body, body enhancement techni techniques, the government doesn't want you to know. I mean, these were just things that I pulled up quickly you know, off of the internet with the simple look, what, the, what does the government not want you to know? Why do we think this way? I mean, when I was in Budapest, uh, I had the... Um, uh, and I was the head of our mission there, and I would go out to, on and talk regularly to the public like this, uh, where, and there's always a sense that we know more than we do, and maybe we're talking in some kind of secret code. So many in the, uh, many of the members of the public, and actually became sort of a game, we're trying to figure, well, what is the code with my neckties? What? <laughs> which is what that article was saying, the good friend code, what, do we, what are his neckties trying to tell us? And it was published in, uh, one, in one magazine, uh, then the, uh, another magazine took it and said, well, uh, that his style sense may not be the greatest, but that he's probably not really uh, conveying that much. And you know, another magazine took it up and uh, it was you know, this, but again, I think there is something attractive, something which is uh, seductive about thinking that there are these secret codes there that uh, uh, that we're using to communicate in ways that are not on the surface uh, and you know, there are concerns about uh, transparency as well we're hiding things so getting you know, moving away from sort of the frivolous to leaking to uh, organizations that say we, you know, we need to expose the secrets of government. And you know, again, pulling together uh, a, just a few slides, whether it's anonymous or WikiLeaks uh, or uh, Snowden, all of these are you know, read from uh, you know, the recent news within the past uh, four or five years. Uh, when I was in uh, Syria, for example, my assignment prior to, uh, uh, to Budapest was uh, head of our consular section in Damascus. And I was there when the uh, dump of documents from WikiLeaks was, uh, was made public. You know, on, the, on the one side, you know, people were saying, well, it, you know, what's the complaint? There's no problem. In fact, it was a benefit to some people in the State Department because it showed that we actually wrote well and knew what was going on in the various countries. But by the same, but, but it also revealed people who had come to us expecting a little bit of confidence, a, a little bit of confidentiality when they came and wanted to tell us what was happening in their country. You know, people who say, I can, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to talk with you, but if my government knows that I'm doing this, 
it will put my life in danger. And certainly that was the case in Damascus. Uh, so when, when WikiLeaks published these documents, which indicated the names of people who had come over the years to give us a better sense of what was happening in the country, you know, there was a lot of concern, a lot of you know, trying to reach out to people to say, we're sorry. We know that you, but we promised you some kind of confidentiality. We know that we promised it, uh, but we're sorry. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do now. You shouldn't, go, except to tell you that if uh, the government were to look on this site and do a search, that they could find your name. Uh, and we'll do whatever we can to try to help you, but there, uh, you know, that your life may be at risk. It's your decision to make. These are some of the issues with regards to why there might be secrets. Generally, we have secrets to protect, to protect sources, methods, uh, for the purpose of national security. And that's about it. It's the secret, we're not supposed to uh, have secrets to protect ourselves from embarrassment. We're not supposed to have secrets to protect, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, so that we save face, or as in that uh, clip from Yes Minister, that it would reveal to the public that we don't know what we're doing. In fact, like I mentioned with WikiLeaks, one of the results was that it did reveal that we probably did know what we were doing but we hadn't meant to have all of those details made public. But, you know, the concern about transparency has gone back to the very beginning of our nation as well, with a quote from George Washington, uh, or a quote from, uh, you know, from uh, the current executive order that, uh, with regards to classifying documentation, what should be considered, why should we have different classifications, what's confidential, what's secret, et cetera. And I won't read those now, but they're there. These are, there are rationales for secrecy. But we also try to have no double standard. So that, uh, you know, this is just a, a, a copy of a page from our foreign affairs manual. It's one, in fact, that I had to abide by as a consular officer, that we can't have information known to us and use it for the benefit of our diplomatic community and not tell American citizens information that bears upon their security because one of our, one of our main functions is to safeguard the welfare of American citizens overseas. And if we have information that we use uh, to protect ourselves, I mean, I've got family members here uh, sitting in the front row. It's very, I'm very happy that they're here too. Uh, if I knew that there was going to be an incident or that there was going to be something that, uh, uh, at the marketplace and I told my family, look, can't tell you why, but stay away from the marketplace today. And we didn't tell the broader community that, then there's a double standard. And our law prevents us from having such a double standard and I'm happy that it does. It meant, it means that you know, for example, like I mentioned, I was in Syria as we, uh, during the last year that we had our embassy open there. It was a year of, uh, you know, of civil unrest, a year of, of danger. We couldn't tell our own colleagues information about the security situation that we would not share with the public. And it meant that we had to be honest internally, and we had to be honest to the public as well. We had in fact, a regular newsletter that we used to advise the public on what we knew so that they could make informed decisions. And it was, uh, we were required to do it and I felt proud to be able to do that as a representative of our government. We have in fact a lot of data and information sharing websites, uh, data.gov, uh, performance.gov, regulations.gov. You can check and see what's happening within your government and are we on track to meet the targets that the citizens have set for our government? Can you hold your government uh, accountable? Those websites are there. Those are across the federal government. There are more, I just pulled together some examples, uh, but there are many, many more. The ones that are showing up now are just from within the State Department uh, as far as not, not our public relations sites, not the sites where we're trying to tell America's story, so to speak, but sites where you can look and see the details of 
the money that we're spending on foreign assistance. Uh, you can uh, see what our strategic objectives are in particular countries, the plans the different embassies have submitted uh, with regards to what are we trying to achieve as the U.S. government within that country. Uh, a range of different sites and again with the idea that we that the, we should default to making information available and transparent. Uh, this is my one academic slide. Uh, uh, looking at communications studies, how do we use information? What's the, what's the value that we get from information? If we start with data, uh, some of this is my own, some of this comes from other places. But if we start from data, data uh, can be meaningless. Red, people, room, you know, different bits of data, 100 people in the room, maybe that's in a, a, a data point. It doesn't mean anything though to us. So putting that, uh, putting that data in context, there are 100 people are in, in this room today listening to a discussion. Okay, that's a bit of information. I can't necessarily do anything with it. Uh, there are 100 people that are, the, the, it's homecoming week this weekend, a lot of people are, be going, are going to be going to, the, uh, to a presentation of the parking lot's likely to be full. That's a bit of intelligence actually now that you can take action. I, sh I should get there early. You know, I, I, it's something that I can act on uh, by taking the information, putting it in context and making it relevant to something that I need to do. Now internalizing that, and maybe this is where humanities comes into play, internalizing this information and making sense of our world so that I don't always have to rely upon discrete data points. But now, in fact, I know something about how society works, how the world works. Every year, you know, around this time, it's homecoming. We should plan ahead. There's probably going to be a lot going on. Uh, so let me tell you from my understanding of how things work. Let me impart my knowledge to you so that we can plan better for next year. Okay, so now it's not that I've received external data. I've internalized it. I have some knowledge that I can share. And if I combine that with a bit of judgment, let's call that wisdom. Uh, that yes, so there are gonna be a lot of people coming here to, uh, for a homecoming next year. Let's plan ahead. And uh, you know, it, it, it's actually been a very good thing for the university. We should be doing this every year. Uh, okay, I, I've implied judgment, and I'll say that that's a bit of wisdom, uh, and, I'll, and everybody has their own wisdom that they can impart. But this is getting value from data, making sense of information. Uh, the, what's on the right there is just text from the opendata.gov website that I've actually shown a screenshot of before. These are the approaches that we take actually within the federal government to how do we use information, why, how do we get value from data, and by making that data, making that information public, we enable everyone to get value from data, to build up knowledge within themselves and understand how their government works. So how does, you know, getting to the title of the presentation, how does transparency help us achieve our diplomatic goals? And again, these are my own thoughts, uh, pulling together a few examples, enabling us to, to shape the narrative. If we don't participate in the conversation, if we don't put information out about what we're doing, uh, but instead hold it to ourselves and, and keep secrets, we have no ability to shape the, to shape the narrative. Uh, what was the value of Homer, of Homer's Iliad, of Homer telling, uh, uh, reciting, uh, reciting the Odyssey, reciting the Iliad, rather than keeping secret, which is the story that we know now about the Trojan War? Whose side are we hearing? We're hearing the side of the group that's able to put information out and help shape that narrative. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, I can't click on these, but these are also links. Uh, uh, in Kosovo, for example, we had a, um, uh, uh, I was working on conflict prevention. The um, uh, Serbia was, uh, was providing its narrative of what it was doing. This is back in the, uh, in the late 1990s. 
Uh, Serbia was providing its narrative with regard to what was happening there in Kosovo. Uh, the Kosovars were providing their narrative. Uh, media was focusing on what, whatever was sensational and with some fact in there. What we tried to do as diplomats was say, well, we need to observe this for ourselves. Let's send observers there who will not only see what's happening, but put out a report every day of what they're seeing. Uh, not as competition with, with media, but to help, uh, one, have it understood that we know what's going on. And getting back to WikiLeaks, what that did do by making reporting open was show that we did know what was going on. Uh, and with Kosovo, the daily reports, which are still up there, of what our observer mission was seeing uh, are still online. We made those public so that the public could see that what we were seeing uh, and we could help shape a narrative. I also used uh, Kos uh, Kosovo as an example with regard to promoting accuracy, uh, that each side had its own, uh, its own version. Okay, if we are trusted, if you trust what we're seeing, uh, you know, that uh, we as our diplomats there who don't have a vested interest in promoting one side or the other, well then we want to promote our, we want to be credible and we want to promote accuracy by putting information out there. You know, again, establishing credibility. If we don't have credibility, then you won't think that whatever we say is also accurate. Uh, the no double standard, by ensuring that we put information out that we know, we help establish our own credibility. Uh, you, it, the, the Moscow example that I would have, that I had there is it describing the visa process. I was in charge of I was a fraud prevention officer in Moscow, also in charge of uh, seeing how do we uh, explain our visa process to people who thought that there were that you had to know someone to get a visa and that's a, a general perception out there that you, if you know someone if you have the right uh, connection you can get a visa if you pay someone uh, you can get a visa and it was to the the benefit of people committing fraud to have secrecy to have opaqueness because then they could say you know the it's a real complex system you've got to know someone uh, pay me and I will help you get that visa what we did, and this was at the very beginnings of the internet, I was in Moscow from 94 to 97. So in 94, we put up a website uh, which explained the visa process, tried to make it appear not complex, uh, tried to ensure that we were credible as far as who you could turn to for information about this process. Uh, and in order to do that, we had to be accurate, we had to be truthful, we had to be willing to engage. Uh, and also putting information out there helps us collaborate, helps us work together. You don't want to partner with someone who won't tell you what they're doing. But if you put your cards on the table, so to speak, if you say, here's everything, here, you can take a look at our finances, see how we're spending money, we'll open up our, our records to you, then that makes it easier to be a partner, to work together towards shared goals, so these are all ways that, be, that being transparent helps us achieve diplomatic goals as we try to partner with other nations, as we try to highlight the values that we have with regard to public participation in the democratic process, with regard to the value of the democratic process, uh, with regard to the universality of human rights and why we believe in these things. Mm -hmm. If we don't open up the doors to our society so that people see how they work here, how is anyone able, able to partner with us and work together towards achieving uh, our, our democratic, diplomatic goals uh, uh, around the world? Uh, in fact, uh, we began in 2009 a, an open government partnership. Uh, the United States set, uh, said that we have, we value open government so much, we think that it furthers the goals of democracy to such an extent that other countries that also believe in this democratic vision should uh, work together with us to further openness in our society. 
because through open government, we build a greater trust among the public in what their government is doing. We're able to work more effectively. It goes back to that quotation from Secretary of State, of State Seward that we, that we had earlier, that unless you have public trust, it's very difficult for government to function effectively in a democratic society. So we uh, worked with other countries to form this open government partnership, but not just with the governments, but with members of civil society as well, with non-governmental organizations that work, that partner with governments to try to hold government accountable, to ensure that in a democracy, the government serves the people and that the people can believe what their government is telling them, and that in this way we further the, uh, the goals of, of democracy. So if you go to the Open Government Partnership website, uh, this is the Open Government Declaration and why uh, we're partnering together to further these goals. The, uh, and I mentioned civil society. Uh, if you look, I showed you uh, websites from the U.S. government about transparency, what we were doing, but it, we also have built up an expectation that we will make this information available, that citizens are paying money to their government and that whatever information we have, to, uh, it belongs to the citizenry. So you have, in fact, one of the sites here uh, is called Publish What You Pay For. Uh, you know, there's, there are other, these are all from uh, civil society websites, from non-governmental organizations that, and there are many, 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 many more organizations that try to work with government to promote different uh, humanitarian agendas, to promote uh, uh, public assistance, to promote uh, furthering various goals. The goals of these particular civil society organizations are to further openness, to further transparency, to hold government accountable. So we have an expectation within our society that we will be transparent, and we have citizens like us, and I include myself among us, although I'm also one of them, uh, but, I, but citizens who hold government accountable. And that's a role that citizens play through, you know, whether individually, whether through voting, or whether through uh, working within a non-governmental organization. And you know, this is, these are recent slides, but I also, have, like I said, I've been uh, working on themes like this for some time. So this was a, a, you know, back in the early days of the internet, 1999. Not the very, very early days, but before we were use, really using it for two-way interaction. Uh, you know, I was wondering, how do we get beyond public, you know, seeing, uh, uh, seeing the internet as just a one-way push of information where we have a sense that it's only propaganda, that any message that, that I can't interact with is just something that's been spun to try to uh, influence me in some way. How do we turn this into a real engagement? So back in 1999, working on conflict prevention, and I'd mentioned that uh, you know, my, the, the, the Kosovo example from that time period with diplomatic observers, that was also something that I was working on. Uh, this was uh, uh, trying to see how can we engage with the public to uh, bring their perspectives into shaping government policy. So we put together a, a forum uh, at the time. In 1999, there weren't too many forums like this, where, or, or fora for the Latin scholars here, the, uh, uh, there weren't too many places like this uh, where you could go and, um, uh, and engage via the internet with government. So we, we uh, settled on the Millennium Goals of the, uh, for, the U, uh, uh, for the UN Assembly, the, the 2000 Millennium Assembly. What should we be focusing on? Uh, and there was a lot of concern when I you know, proposed this to, uh, to say we're going to open this up and engage with the public. You know, too many people will write to us. Too many people will want to engage with us and we don't really have the time to engage with so many people. So, but we tried it. We tried it and frankly I had to I had to contact a lot of people to say, will you please write something, engage with us, will you use this forum? Anyone who's tried to, to have a vibrant, dynamic, internet-based forum has probably faced this where you open it up 
and it, there's silence. Uh, so using this tool to try to engage the public and work with government, you know, it's not just a matter of opening up the door and people will act. You have to engage with them. So getting back to the um, getting back to the uh, to the yes minister clip, maybe people do want that right to be ignorant. Maybe we because we have been transparent. I'll put this provocative question out there. Uh, maybe we you know, we put we've opened our doors. We we are we're not secret. We in fact put information out, but we don't get the engagement. You know, citizens know what's happening within their government. Citizens, whatever country it is, if you, you look, there are many countries where, where they, the, the citizens have pressed for, uh, for government to open its doors, and there are some who still hope that if the public only knew, then they would make the right decision. But, you know, I have to wonder, is that really the case? You know, transparency, being a strong advocate for it, I do hold that if we could make information available that people, I believe in the goodness of uh, people wanting to do the right thing, that we have these, these shared visions, these shared goals, that we, if we had the same information and believed it to be accurate and credible, that we would work towards a positive future. But that's not always what we see. So, I'll wrap up with a, another clip from The Wizard of Oz. Well, first of all, you know, the, the wizard now, he's been, you know, he's been uh, unmasked, but he's a nice guy. People have sort of forgotten about all the killing and all of the bad things that he did before when he hid behind the veil, and now he's just a, he's a nice old guy revealing himself, helped, uh, you know, helped him, and he's going to fly off back to Kansas, even though his balloon says Omaha, uh, but he's, so he's going, to, he's going to fly off, leaving Dorothy and the rest back there wondering, well, what are we supposed to do? And the answer comes, Will you help me? Can you help me? You don't need to be helped any longer. You've always had the power to go back to Kansas. I have. Then why didn't you tell her before? Because she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn it for herself. What have you learned, Dorothy? So I'll leave it with <laughs> what have we learned? I mean, we are transparent. The information is there. I didn't play any X-Files videos here. But the, the information is there. Uh, how do we use it? How do we work not by thinking that we're in a society where everything is secret? Because that's actually too easy. How do we work in a society where, in fact, we have information and it's transparent and the responsibility is, in fact, on us to do something with that information? And again, this being Humanities Month, I think it takes a good humanities education to make the best of that information. I don't, uh, I guess there's time now for questions. What time is it? Left a little bit of time. So, thank you. Yes, in, in the back. Okay, I'll restate the question the, uh, to make sure I understand and also for the recording, that you know, given the challenges of actually coming to an agreement, if everything is out in the open, you know, that if you've got members of the public, if you've got vested interest uh, at your elbow as you're trying to negotiate, uh, how can you come to a, an effective agreement? Uh, is, is that a fair statement? The, and, th and that is something which is a, you know, is a challenge. In fact, the, uh, the, uh, another constraint on transparency is ongoing negotiations. Uh, this, and this has been something, again, you could go back to the beginning of our nation with how did we get the constitution that we have? Uh, how do we go from being the um, uh, from from being a, a confederation or, or, or the Articles of Confederation, 
not the Confederacy, but going from the Articles of Confederation, which were very loose and which didn't enable the government to collect taxes, which uh, after a short time, we might have fallen apart as a, as a country, uh, to, ha to this emergency second constitutional convention where the representatives negotiated our current constitution in secret. And there'd be a lot of uh, concern. Would they have been able to negotiate that type of constitution, which gave so much more power to the federal government if it had been, if the public had known what they were doing? One could say that you know, within the EU, their inability now to, act, to have a constitution, maybe because there's too much uh, public uh, uh, awareness of, or public involvement in the negotiations. So, you know, and you can think of other negotiations uh, where uh, secrecy has been important to trying to come to an agreement. Uh, I mentioned Kosovo a couple of times. Uh, they try at the end of the Kosovo war, the uh, war in Kosovo, there was a, a, there were negotiations in a place in France, Rambouillet, uh, to try to negotiate, uh, negotiate a, an end to the hostilities. A challenge though was people have cell phones now, they're able to put out information right away from within the, uh, from within what were supposed to have been tightly held negotiations. So yes, Transparency can, does impact negotiations, and it may be useful to try to get to a certain point without all of this public, uh, public focus and attempts to, to create uh, carry out negotiations through referendum. But at the same time, the terms of those neg negotiations in the end, when we're going to agree to them, I would say shouldn't be secret. And getting to your point about the, uh, the Iran deal, the, the challenge now is that people think that there were things that were hidden. There were things that, that people that we were not told that that, uh, the, uh, that, that deal had secret clauses that, uh, uh, that no one will ever know about, which damages credibility, which causes people to challenge whether or not this is an effective agreement. So uh, following on that, if we are going to have an agreement, the details should be available to, uh, to the public that is essentially being committed to this particular agreement. And maybe that's the, the trade-off that, you that you're able to negotiate within some relatively secure framework, but that you can't hold the data, the information, secret beyond, uh, beyond the time that is necessary to come to an agreement, is my own personal perspective. Yes. And thank you. Uh, which is a, a, a useful question, an interesting question, which I'll touch on with an anecdote. I'll repeat the question the, uh, that while representing the United States overseas and representing our values and what we're trying to accomplish, it, there may be friction with host governments because there may be a conflict in values, or they may be, or they, that country may see our uh, our espousing American values as a uh, as uh, interfering in their domestic affairs. How do we balance that out? Generally, you know, I've tried to identify what our shared values are. What are our common values? Uh, in uh, in whichever country, generally, the uh, the dignity of the human uh, of human beings is something that at least they give lip service to. That we think that all people ha des deserve some amount of dignity. Can we start there? Uh, what are the other things that we you know, that that entails? Do what rights do we have? Uh, can we agree on? on there being certain basic universal rights. In fact, you could look at the United Nations as being an embodiment of that, where uh, there is a universal declaration of human rights that member nations, most member nations, agreed to. So if we're espousing something that nations have signed up to, is that an interference in their internal matters? If we're saying you know, that we believe these rights to be universal. You've signed up for that. You've signed up for that as well. Uh, do you no longer agree with that? Let's talk about this. 
Uh, <clears throat> when I was in Hungary, you know, this was often a, an approach that I was trying to take, that we, we are both, in, you know, not only are we allies, uh, we're members of NATO, uh, we're members of the OSCE, uh, we are allies, uh, with, uh, and Hungary is a member of the European Union. You'd think it's a, you know, that it's a safe bet to say that we have shared values, we believe in uh, democratic principles and the uh, and that we can work together towards achieving our our aspirations, our the aspirations based based upon our shared values and interests. Uh, however, uh, saying you know, that uh, we you know, that we don't always hit our targets, we don't always meet our democratic uh, ambitions, uh, and there are areas that we are um, you know, there there are areas where we're falling behind. Saying that aloud actually touched some very raw nerves uh, in Hungary. Uh, in Hungary, uh, as, we, you know, as we tried to pursue, uh, Secretary of State Clinton had said that uh, there was a, uh, that Hungary was, was, uh, uh, that, that was rolling back democracy. Uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary has been promoting what he called about three years ago, illiberal democracy. Uh, you know, there were uh, severe concerns. In fact, just this week, the uh, the Central European University, which was one that is uh, was uh, founded by uh, by George Soros, trying to promote openness within Eastern European society and liberal values, the uh, uh, and humanities being a big part of it that they feel they're being forced to close their doors because the government is saying that, the, uh, that what they are teaching is not in accordance with what the government would like to have uh, taught. So, the, uh, so there, is, there can be a, a tension. In fact, the, you know, there, were, there were wagers as to, when, as to whether I would be named persona non grata, uh, in addition to trying to figure out my, the code behind my neckties. Uh, <laughs> But you know, th this was a, um, a you know, it is a challenge that diplomats face. But when we are sent overseas, we have to recognize that we are representing the United States. Uh, we're representing U.S. values, uh, and we try. And as diplomats, we try to find what we share so that we can work together effectively towards achieving a common, uh, a common goal. And that gets back to open government. The more that we're able to share about what our goals are. I'd mentioned that online we have our strategic objectives for our relations with, with, with each country. Each embassy has, has submitted those. Those are online. Countries can see them. Uh, and if we hope that through doing this we, we build credibility, we build a relationship that enables us to overcome some of those tensions. But yes, the tensions do exist. Please. What about that? So the, uh, again, restating the question, re restating the question, we can't assume that you know, that everyone is going to use information from openness uh, to create a positive, better world and work to get work with us as friends, as allies. That there are people that really want to do us damage, and releasing information like that blindly, just out of on good faith, and saying, "Here, know all our secrets." Uh, we hurt, we hurt ourselves, and that we should punish people who do that kind of thing. What, you know, what's the answer to that? And like, you know, like I'd said before, I was in Syria when the documents that were stolen by Corporal Manning were released, and the, you know, the, the damage with regards to our ability to work with, uh, with people and, and have them feel some confidence in giving us uh, information that would be useful for our security for, and for uh, working together towards a, a, a better world. Uh, it put, the release of that put them at, uh, at risk. I agree that this was a, you know, that, you know, this was a, a treasonous release of information. The, it, the penalties for that, that's something for us to determine as a, as a society, what should be the penalty. But as far as the nature of actions and, and ensuring that we are judicious in what we release, and that there are, you know, I, I had a, uh, 
citation earlier from the executive order with regards to classification, uh, which also highlights that we should try to, 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 to default to class to not classifying or to, to classifying things at the, at the lowest possible uh, level of classification so that we can work with that information. You know, again, getting back to what, how do we balance, how do we mitigate risk? Because we're never going to be able to eliminate the risk of information being released. Uh, you know, we can put as tight a security around something as, as possible. Maybe something won't be released in the short term. But ultimately, we have to recognize that information will be made accessible if we are the society that we uh, believe we are with the Freedom of Information Act, with people having rights to certain information, or with people leaking information because of their own self-interest. That it's going that so how do we mitigate that risk and ensure that we are making information available when we can while protecting the, th the information that would be damaging to our national security uh, even uh, as, as, as tightly as possible. Where there, and we have, to, we have to make sure that we have identified the risk and that we have, important sa uh, that we have the appropriate safeguards to ensure that it's not released uh, because of the security interests. But not broaden that to say that everything that we do uh, is a uh, should not be released uh, because again getting back to that uh, that infor that uh, information pyramid if you have information that you can't share well then you can't do anything with it if you can't share information with your allies then you can't work together and coordinate if you hold information to yourself then you are the only one who knows it and you have to do things individually so trying to ensure that we have you know, trusted partners, knowing who we can share information with, and uh, working to ensure that the information that we can't share uh, is protected uh, and that there's very little. And I think we're wrapping up now. Can I take one more question? So the question is, for students of humanities, what would I recommend uh, that they do, that they study, uh, in order to take advantage of their humanities education? I think uh, part of it is knowing well, what do they want to do. Uh, that humanities itself it gives them a basis to adapt this understanding of society, this understanding of culture, of languages, of how we think to almost anything. And because it's so amorphous, because it can be applied to almost anything, there's a sense that it can't be applied to anything. Because you know, I, I know about the world, it's in vague terms, what, uh, what can I use it for? And that gets back to sort of the question I posed at the end. What do we do with what we know? And that's something that we take upon ourselves. What, you, what is it that I would like to do? Uh, can I you know, talk with people who, have, who do this kind of thing? Am I interested in, in government? Then what is it that I can apply my, st my studies here to within government with regard to uh, relationships with other, with other cultures? Am I interested in leading teams in business? Well, how does what I relate to, how does, how does what I study here give me an understanding of, of human interaction and leading a team? What can be shared? What, what, is, what, is, what should be kept secret? What, uh, uh, what, uh, where are we going as a country with regards to being able to look a little bit ahead and make my business plan for what is going to be valuable five years down the road. And I think humanities students, because they understand the past perhaps, can take that understanding and try to create a vision of what, uh, where we will be going in the future and target themselves to what the, where they see themselves within that future. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah.